That was very dramatic. Okay. It was. I was not <laughs> I expecting that. that. <laughs> well, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to History Matters and So Does Coffee with the National Council for History Education and wonderful historian Joanne Freeman. We're delighted to have you with us this morning. I am beyond happy to be here. I am always happy to be here. Um, and as I mentioned on Twitter, and I will readily confess, late in the game, uh, my last couple of weeks have been bonkers. And so it's like Thursday is when I suddenly think, <laughs> I need to think of a topic. But as I did say yesterday, um, we're going to be talking about insurrection today for a whole bunch of reasons. But before I launch into insurrection, my new partner in crime, my always partner in crime, Grace, is going to explain the rules of the game. Thank you. I'm, I'm Grace Leatherman. I'm the executive director of the National Council for History Education. Um, your usual partner in crime, Matt Messias, is closing on his house today. So we congratulate him. It was quite a feat in this market. So we're very, we're very pleased he's able to have a new home for his family. And I'm thrilled to be here. This is always a treat for me. So everyone, uh, Joanne will be speaking about the topic of insurrection. Please feel free to chat with each other in the chat. But if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A so that I can see those. And I'll be happy to pass those on to, uh, to Joanne, please keep the questions germane about history. And then just remember, this is a family show. Um, and afterward, we will have an after party where you, we will turn the recording off and you'll just be able to, to converse and, and we'll be part of an informal community. But we thank you very much. And uh, I'm excited to hear what you have to say, Joanne. Hey, thanks. OK, so um, insurrection. I chose insurrection um, partly. And I thought this morning, and I will say that um, We've been doing this long enough. Let's see if I can change the view here. Okay, there we go. We've been doing this long enough that I now forget sometimes if I've talked talk about something before. In this case, I, I couldn't decide what I had said before. I know I've talked about violence. Um, I know I've talked about protest, but I don't think I've talked about insurrection, which means something different. And so actually I wanna start out with definitions um, as a good historian does. Um, by insurrection, I don't mean rioting just for the sake of rioting. So I don't mean any sort of mass rioting moment. I don't mean mobbing. So again, not just people angry doing things in the street to express anger, which in one way or another, we could define, we could decide how we want to define protest. I, I normally define it as low on the violence factor, but regardless, um, and I'm not talking about protest gone awry. I'm actually talking about today insurrection, meaning an explicit attack on the government or on institutions of government to um, stop it in its duty or to overthrow it. So insurrection really against a government or government structures. Now, when I was in grad school, I remember having, um, so I took colonial history and I took early national history in grad school. And I remember having a sort of aha moment uh, when I was taking colonial history and I realized all of the other insurrections that I really hadn't focused on before. And I'm gonna come back to them in a moment, but I meant uh, Bacon's Rebellion uh, in Virginia and Leisler's Rebellion in New York. There were all of these rebellions. And as a matter of fact, I remember, um, I think I was preparing for my oral comprehensive exams, but I, I think I made up um, a question and an answer that had to do with the, the tradition of insurrection uh, in the colonies and then in the United States. Um, and I'm going to, at the end of this uh, commentary on, on insurrections, I'm going to come back to some of the patterns. But what I felt I saw at the time and what I really wanted to talk about today was patterns in insurrection, what seems to strike them off, like what, what seems to get them going, and what that might have to do with um, American traditions of um, government and governess, um, governance, not governess, although I'm all in favor of governesses too, but governance, um, what it has to do with what Americans assume about the law, about the government, and about constitutions. Um, but to get there, I'm going to start by talking a little bit um, about some of these rebellions uh, and then come back to the, the pattern, which indeed is what historians always look for is the pattern. So Bacon's Rebellion um, took place in 1676. Um, I will always remember that because I was once at an airport and the guy behind the desk checking people their tickets was taking a history course and actually said out loud, 
I had to study for tomorrow and I don't know when Bacon's Rebellion was. <laughs> and I did, right? And I re responded and he kind of looked at me and I thought, wow, you know, historian on call. <laughs> Wherever you need one, there I am. Um, but Bacon's Rebellion, um, and, and all of my descriptions of these rebellions are going to be very abbreviated, so subtleties will be missed, I will say in advance. Um, Bacon's Rebellion um, was led by Nathaniel Bacon, appropriately enough. Um, part of what it had to do with was, um, and a book to read about this is American Slavery, American Freedom by Edmund Morgan, who, who really describes it in a really interesting and useful kind of a way. One of the things he describes in there is that he calls them angry young men, uh, are, are the people who were behind this particular insurrection or rebellion. And they were people who had come to Virginia and felt that they were entitled, and entitlement will be a word to think about here, they were entitled to a certain amount of land, that Native Americans were denying settlers the land that they felt entitled to, and that the government was too soft on Native Americans and needed to do something. So in this case, it was angry young men, and there were actually others who took part too. It was angry people who wanted and felt entitled to land. That was part of why they came to this colony in the 17th century. They weren't getting what they wanted. They felt that power was being held by just a few in government. And so there was indeed a rebellion against the colonial government. Um, I believe Jamestown was burned down. You know, I mean, it was like, it was a rebellion. And in the end, um, armed forces, put it down and um, Bacon died a miserable death of dysentery, I believe. So, um, but that that's that's an insurrection, right? That's a rebellion against the government, an explicit attack against the government that Bacon and the people operating with him felt was unfair. Leisler's Rebellion. Okay, so Leisler's Rebellion um, takes place in the late 17th century in New York. And it partly had to do with um, the British taking control of a number of colonies at that particular moment, including New York, and instituting to get control over these colonies, um, what was ominously called the Dominion of New England, which I just always think sounds like a Star Wars villain, like Darth Vader it rules the Dominion somehow. But anyway, the Dominion of New England, um, it enforced uh, a kind of outside rule in a way, and Dominion was the appropriate word for it, of these colonies in a way to sort of get order. Um, colonists, generally speaking, in Massachusetts, in New York, in New Jersey, were not fond of this. They felt that they had their charters, they had their governments, they did not welcome this kind of government intrusion. Um, and so again, um, there was a rebellion, an insurrection. For a time, the, the in New York, the government was under militia control, right? They just ousted um, the representatives of the Dominion government. Um, they felt entitled to their own governments and to having governments that they felt that they had a say in. So again, there was a sense of entitlement there. Um, and after a few years that gets repressed, but also the government changes. So in a sense, they get some degree of what they're asking for in that case. Okay, then Shay's Rebellion, um, which I'll bet a lot of you have already heard of. Um, and Shays' Rebellion happens not very long, a year or two before the Constitutional Convention, and it, it does indeed figure in a lot of people's comments about why a new constitution is necessary. Um, this takes place largely in Massachusetts. Um, it's a lot of people, including veterans, who had gotten very little pay from the revolution, who owed um, debts, who were being asked for taxes. <laughs> Newby is like bobbing his head in excited agreement, just so you know what's going on over there. And I'll try not to look because it's one of my favorite things. Um, so Shays Rebellion, they, people had debts, people, there were taxes now being asked for in a way that they hadn't before. They weren't getting pay from the revolution. They began, people who were protesting against all of this began to close the courts that were responsible for the judicial processes that either were going to collect what was owed to the government or was going to take back property from people who weren't paying. So again, they, in this case, attack uh, Daniel Shays and the people who agree with him, attack a system of, part of the system of government to stop what they consider to be unfair. Um, it begins to spread, this, this rebellion uh, begins to spread. Um, and it appears to be, for a time, very hard to put down, partly 
because the uh, convent the Confederation Congress, the Articles of Confederation Congress, didn't really have power to put it down, right? And they sort of asked other colonies for volunteers to create some kind of force to go in and put down Shay's rebellion. Um, and they basically had no power to demand that and it didn't happen. And in the end, Shay's rebellion causes a great degree of disorder um, because there are these people who are, you know, closing down courts and refusing to pay what they consider to be unfair debt and again partly because they haven't been given what they feel entitled to many of them which is pay for their service during the revolution um ultimately it is a private army raised by um people in massachusetts that puts down shay's rebellion wealthy people create an armed force of their own to put it down which in and of itself is kind of remarkable and a little frightening but um there were a lot of people involved in shay's rebellion again in this case they feel that they're being asked for something that the government isn't entitled to have because the government hasn't lived up to its part of the bargain in giving them pay for some of their service. And that did indeed, it was not the cause of the Constitutional Convention, but a lot of people, including people like Hamilton and, and Washington, um, in talking about the need for a stronger government, they point to Shays' Rebellion and say, look at that, like it was people rebelling against the government in Massachusetts and our government, the Articles of Confederation, couldn't do anything about it. That's a big problem, you know? And so you get, you see a lot of language. Um, I think there's a letter from around that time from Hamilton that says something like, um, I fear that we're going to let this moment pass when we could really take advantage of what we accomplished in the revolution and, and move towards something better. I'm afraid that this is going to pass us by and we won't take advantage of this moment for better government. But anyway, so that's Shay's Rebellion. Whiskey Rebellion, again, another one you folks might have heard of. Now, I'm, I'm going to just back up for a minute here. Bacon's Rebellion, Leisler's Rebellion, Shay's Rebellion, Whiskey Rebellion. Whiskey Rebellion is in response to a tax on whiskey implemented by the new government under the Constitution by Hamilton and the Treasury Department. It's the first tax imposed on a domestic product by the newly formed federal government. So it's within a very short amount of time after the government goes into effect under the Constitution, it was intended to generate some revenue for the Revolutionary War debt. Um, for the people, particularly in Western Pennsylvania, some of them used whiskey, and actually this affected other forms of distilled spirits as well, but whiskey was the, the, the sort of biggest deal of them all. Um, some of these farmers used whiskey as a medium of exchange. Um, they some of them felt that this was being imposed on them and that they were not being represented in a way that allowed them to protest against what they considered to be an unfair tax, um, although it was passed through the government, so one could contest that. Um, and they began to use violence and intimidation to prevent the collection of that tax. Um, and in this case, actually, as in the case of Shay's Rebellion, as in the case of um, ultimately Bacon's Rebellion, armed troops are marched in to put it down. Um, and in this case, an actual armed force that's pretty sizable on the part of the federal government is sent out to Western Pennsylvania to put down the Whiskey Rebellion, which Hamilton in particular sees as um, a sign that people have no respect for the new government, and so it must be crushed immediately so that people understand that this new government has power um, and that whoever the forces that are sent out there, he says, you know, need to be sizable and powerful. He says something in this period in, in a letter like um, government, whenever it appears, ought to appear like a Hercules, right? Because, and he's working on the assumption that people don't respect this new government. It's new, their state governments, for most people, their state governments feel more immediate, more powerful, they're accustomed to them. There's this new government that's been sort of grafted on top of everything. There isn't necessarily a tradition of authority for that, of, of people respecting it. And Hamilton in particular was always very eager to respond to signs of disrespect against the government with armed force. He, he was right there with that again and again and again in his mind because the power of the government wasn't being respected. And if it wasn't respected from the outset, it was not going to survive. So the Whiskey Rebellion ultimately fizzles in part 
because an armed force is sent, by the time the armed forces get to Western Pennsylvania, uh, with actually Hamilton going along with the troops because he was acting Secretary of War, probably a happy moment for Hamilton who loved military moments, um, the, the, it already had sort of fizzled before the troops got there. Uh, and Hamilton, uh, there are accounts of him interrogating whiskey rebels and clearly frustrated at the fact that there's nothing there now for them to do. Whatever happened, it's gone. And he, I don't think he ever admits that it might have been an overreaction <laughs> on the part of the government, but at any rate, Whiskey Rebellion. Um, I'm going to mention two more, and then I'm going to come back to talk about patterns. Um, another one that I want to mention, which it doesn't often get mentioned, uh, and I believe it's pronounced Fry's Rebellion, F-R-I-E-S, takes place under Adams's presidency. Um, and again, it's about taxes. Uh, in this case, taxes are raised to help pay for um, the not quite a war called the quasi war uh, against France. So taxes are raised uh, to help pay for preparation for that quasi war. Um, the Fry's rebels feel that the taxes being raised are unfair. They don't know how to make their voices heard to say that they think this is unfair. There's um, armed um, resistance against the collection of taxes, again, from tax collectors. Um, and ultimately, again, rebellion is put down. And in this case, Adams, um, there are people arrested and Adams pardons them uh, for a variety of reasons. But I think in part um, to show, I think he, first he says something about setting a precedent and he doesn't necessarily want to set that sort of dire precedent. And then he, then he sort of qualifies it and says something like, um, these were miserable German immigrants who didn't know. And, and so he, he sort of moves from OK to bad. But at any rate, um, this ends without real serious punishment of any kind. Um, the other rebellions that are happening throughout this period, but there are a couple that are noteworthy, of course, are slave rebellions. The one in particular I'll mention now is Gabriel's Rebellion, um, which happens like right at the cusp of the turn of the 18th to the 19th century. And Gabriel Foster, um, organizes um, a you know slave rebellion um, inspired in part by the rhetoric and logic of revolution um, and it's not surprisingly put down with extreme force and there are executions and and that is treated very differently than other rebellions are treated but when talking about the spirit of rebellion and a sense of what people are entitled to Freedom is one of those things. So they need to be counted um, as part of the same spirit, though coming from a very different direction. This is, the, in a sense, the, one of the most fundamental rights of all is, is freedom. Um, now, one of the things that struck me when I first started thinking about this chain of rebellions, and there are more that I didn't go into, but these are sort of the, the biggies. Um, and I use this word over and over again, is um, many of them stem in one way or another from a sense of entitlement. People who are entitled to land, people who are entitled to pay and feel that taxes are unfair, people who feel entitled to say something about taxes that they think are unfair, people who feel entitled to human freedom. There's a sense of entitlement. Uh, and related to that, there's a sense among many of these people that they're not being heard. Their demands are not being heard their needs are not being heard. And in many cases, they don't feel that there's a pathway to be heard. They don't think there's a way to step forward and express their demands and actually be heard by the government in a formal kind of a way. So part of what's happening here is part of what these insurrections represent is people who feel entitled to something and don't feel that there's a way for them to make that demand. And so they turn their back on the system they say the system can't deal with me. It's it's not. Um, it shouldn't have the power that it does have because it it's not hearing me, and I deserve to be heard. Uh, and that helps spark the spirit of rebellion. Now, in all of these cases, it is true that, uh, or at least in many of them, the governments, the various governments, colonial governments, national government, um, really reacted powerfully and sometimes over reacted because they sensed these rebellions were indeed what they were, which is um, acts aimed against the government. 
Um, but what's interesting about this, and this is kind of a spirit of things that um, I've never researched, uh, and I've always meant to, and I, I haven't. Um, I mentioned it to a, a grad student recently, and um, he was intrigued, which then made me feel like maybe, maybe someone will research it. Part of what, so, so the spirit of entitlement that people have this very strong feeling of what they're entitled to and how their government should work and that they should have something to say about their government. I think there's an interesting link between that and the fact that these are colonies who came with charters and their governments are very explicitly described on paper. They're small governments. They're largely, even though they're national government, I'm gonna turn this off. Um, they're, they're intimate enough that people know who their lawmakers are. Um, and I, I've always wondered whether there's something in what begins as the colonial American spirit that encourages this sense of entitlement because you, government was a more intimate thing. And as a colonist, you were sort of granted a government and given rights. And as a colonist, in a sense, you were doing something for the empire. So there's a tradition there about constitutionalism that I can't go into detail because I haven't researched yet, but it's always struck me as really interesting. Now, let's obviously make the segue there. Obviously, I've been thinking about this in light of what happened on January 6th. Um, and some of what I thought was, um, you know, these are people who certainly felt entitled in one way or another to power. Um, these are people who felt that the system didn't hear them or represent them. Um, but in this case, they were literally saying that the electoral system just didn't include them, which isn't true, but that was the spirit under which they were acting. So, you know, if you're defining an insurrection as an attack on government, and if you're putting into that definition, people who feel entitled to something and who feel that the government isn't hearing or understanding their sense of entitlement, January 6th falls into that tradition. And I know that there's still a lot of talk about, um, not only talk about, you know, did it happen or was it like evil leftists who did it, but, but even on a slightly more serious level, was it an insurrection? Was it a protest? Was it an attack? Was it a mob? Or whatever it was. Was it a coup? Um, it was not just a mob and it certainly wasn't just protest because it was explicitly aimed at overturning the process of government, stopping the counting of votes, stopping the decision about an election. So in that sense, it was an insurrection. In that sense, some of the spirit behind it, there is a, a sort of long-standing American tradition of it, but one of the things that the American Constitution was trying to put into place was a system that you could resort to before you move on to something more dire. And by that, I mean, obviously, the, the voting system, the electoral system itself, the fact that you have a very important right to protest, the fact that the courts are available, the fact that the Supreme Court is available. Part of what the process is aimed to do is to provide pathways of, of making demands. If you follow down those pathways and your demands aren't met, that's always been a moment in American history when things move into potentially a more violent realm. Even in those cases though, most of those moments, people are not basically trying to entirely overturn the government. They want certain rights and they feel that the government is invalid because it's not giving them that right. So part of the, the moral of this story is number one, it's again, something I've been thinking a lot um, in recent months and certainly uh, watching what was happening on January 6th, it's a reminder of the degree to which protest is important and, and that it means something, right? That, that people should have and would have been allowed to stand in front of the Capitol and protest what they felt was unfair. They could have brought their gallows. They could have done whatever they wanted and stood in front of the Capitol and protested. Protest is important. There's a reason why it's basically in the Bill of Rights it represents one of many tools for the public to express their needs and thoughts and demands. It's important. And that obviously in all of American history, there have been moments when there are people protesting who many people don't agree with, the Klan, among other things, and they're allowed to do something, parade or whatever else in a, a civil form of protest because we allow that to happen even if we don't agree with the people doing it. 
Um, but that said, January 6th sort of falls in a tradition of things that have happened in the past. But in this case, it was protesting, staging an insurrection against the entire government of the United States at its center, right? It wasn't people in a city or people in a colony. It, it was basically a statement that the government didn't represent them and didn't hear them, which is problematic in a government that's run through democratic elections, where, as I said on Twitter this morning, in elections, you win or you lose, and that happens every time. And if you lose, then there's another election that comes along and you can change things. Newbie feels very strongly about this. Newbie is a democracy history bird. Um, but at any rate, there's a system in place to at least begin with, to allow you to step forward and talk about when things aren't fair. That doesn't mean they're gonna be fixed, but it's a way to start a conversation. And then you continue to push and do what you need to do to get where you wanna be. Sometimes in the past that has required civil disobedience or even in some cases violence, certainly extreme protests. I'm not saying that everyone just sort of asks for fairness and the government should give it to them, but I think people who step forward and want to essentially topple the entire government, that's beyond protesting being excluded from the government. That's just anti-government, that's anti-democracy. I don't think, and, and this is true today when a lot of people are um, on Twitter yelling at me for misunderstanding the Constitution, um, I, I think people fundamentally don't understand what the Constitution does, what it sets in place, that it's not just a statement of rights, that the Bill of Rights are a separate thing. They're amendments to a document that created not just a government, but a government with systems in place for people to be able to change or alter or protest what it was. That was an important part of the constitution and in that sense of a democratic republic. The whole world was a monarchy at the time. We created a democratic republic with the idea that the public has far more power in this kind of government than in these other forms of government. It doesn't mean that the power was being distributed in a fair way, certainly not in an even way, or that it still has not been distributed in a fair or even way, and that we don't have a lot of work to do to push towards something more equitable than we've achieved in the past. But it's one thing to demand change, and it's another thing to truly just want to overturn the entire system. That stems from something we've talked about before here, which I really think, you know, I, I refer a lot to the absence of a we, right? I, I, um, Peter Ono, my, my former graduate advisor, now jokes about the amount of times that in our conversations, I talk about the collapsing we. Um, and I've talked before about how the refusal of people to wear masks for the common good, because they feel that their rights are being impinged upon, that represents the absence of a we. The Constitution is kind of a pact that we take with each other, um, and that is a starting point for our political process. If you turn your back on the Constitution and the powers that it puts in play and the ways in which it at least wants you to start out by making demands and you just sort of dismiss it. You've dismissed any sense of a common good and basically decided that anyone who doesn't agree with you is excluded from that common good. And again, as I've said many times before, not only is that a big problem, that's anti-democratic. Democracy is about, um, includes protest and includes argument and includes debate and includes angriness and includes all kinds of forms of contention because it's a contest. Democracy is based on a contest of wills expressed through representation. That's what it's supposed to be. And there are always clashing opinions and there are always clashing wills. And the system is at least a way to start that process. Again, I'm not gonna say that there's never a moment when things cross lines. Um, there are no absolutes. And you, know, you can talk about civil rights and some of the ways in which demands being made and even some of the ways today that demands being made are not heard and it feels like there needs to be another way to make demands i'm not necessarily saying it justifies violence but it means you can't just assume that going to a court is going to solve problems all of that said my point today is on the one hand what happened on january 6th sort of relates to a general american tradition of feeling entitled to things and then entitled to not just protest, 
but revolt against a government to get them, but it's a thing apart because of what that rebellion, what that insurrection was actually trying to do. Okay, I'm gonna stop. I was getting up on my soapbox. I'm gonna get off my soapbox um, and stop blathering here and open things up uh, for questions. It's obviously a really big topic, um, but it certainly felt like one that was important to address. This is a, a great topic and one that we've got a big audience and lots of great questions. People are people are excited about this. I think it's I something that they were like, I missed 96 messages. However, Carolee has done what she must do. Mug and background. OK, I, I you know, beyond year one and there's maybe been twice that I remembered about the mug um, mug. OK, you'll you'll understand immediately why I use this mug. This mug represents the spirit of insurrection. <laughs> I was, I really was stumped when I woke up. I thought, mug, do I have a mug? And I looked in my cabinet and you can, this can mean many things. And it's actually French. Um, however, it does seem to represent people on horseback doing something active and we can pretend <laughs> that they're in one way in, or another involved in an insurrection. So that is the mug for today. Okay, great. So I have, and about. I have my background. Does anyone know what the background was? Joanne, you had a guess. I did have a guess, but I want other folks to guess first. Western Massachusetts. And my guess could be wrong. It's just the first thing that popped into my mind. Western New York. So this is actually, uh, this is Braddock's Battlefield, which was also, so we get two double history. We get uh, French and Indian War, but also this was also a meeting spot for the Whiskey Rebellion. And I like the I was going to say Whiskey Rebellion. It looked Whiskey Rebellion-ish to me. So. Yeah. Um, I did not know the Braddock connection, but yeah. I did think it looked like Western Pennsylvania. So you guys were on track, Western Massachusetts, Western New York, you were getting there. Um, and I did talk about Massachusetts and New York. So, you know, those are justified rebellions in both places. Yes. Um, but that was good. And you stumped a lot of people. I think someone wants to- Oh yeah, not quite the Connecticut River, no. Yeah. There you go. Um, well, and actually, I want to use this as a jumping off point into the questions that people have, because I noticed um, Matt often teases me, but he says my happy place is the Library of Congress website. And that's totally true. I just get lost in there forever. And that's what I did with this. I just put insurrection into the Library of Congress to see what would happen. Um, and I noticed that things that I ne didn't necessarily think of as insurrections were classified by the library as insurrections or the title was insurrection so and we do have a question about language and and I, I mean this comes up with most topics that we talk about but there is a question here why are some why are some things called rebellions and others insurrections and we also have a question about are you only called a patriot if you win so could you speak a little bit about that the word. language of this? Who gets to call it an insurrection? And I think that's that's interesting. You define it as attacking the government. But what else can you say about the language here? Yeah, no, I definitely want to talk about that. I do also want to say, though, it seems to me perhaps people have not checked off reply to all panelists and attendees, which I normally say at the beginning and I forgot because someone says they can't they're not seeing everything everyone says. So I will toss that in here. Um, language, obviously, let me move this out of the way. I get so into what you guys are saying. I forget what I'm supposed to be saying. Um, language matters, obviously, a lot. Um, words, word choice matters a lot. And I, I've talked a bazillion times, I know, on here about um, one of the distinctive things about our government being um, that a democratic republic is grounded on public opinion. And what that means is that things like language or words, word choice by people in power can, or people who want power can have a huge impact. Now, I started out defining insurrection for this very reason, right? I, I wanted mm -hmm. it to be clear. I wasn't just talking about any moment of violence, that there was a, a concrete attack on government in some way. That was my definition for the purposes of us here and now. You know, to me, riot can mean anything. Mob can mean anything. But also, I'm readily aware, like I just was curious, I made my list of, of things I was going to talk about. And then I went to Wikipedia even. And I was like, insurrection. And you know, they have a huge list of insurrections, some of which I think are, and some of which I think aren't. And I, you know, it was one of the interesting things that happened um, on and just after January 6th, 
is people talking about what to call it. That, that was a decision of huge political importance, right? That if you called it a protest, um, that would suggest that that kind of thing is allowable, which it isn't. It's an attack on government and it downplays the seriousness of what happened. Should it be called a coup? That has to do with motive, and a lot of people had very strong feelings about that. Um, those words matter because they're about motive and intent and um, and power distribution, I guess, in one way or another. So I think it's easy to assign those words, and I think I'm um, kind of like the people in my most recent book say, uh, and as you're suggesting here, Grace, words matter tremendously um, because in the end they will shade in and frame something uh in whatever way those words want are, are going to frame it in other words they can change the meaning and intention and impact of events so my my starting with definitions is indeed what a good historian does but it also is key right because really what i'm talking about is revolting against government explicitly violently revolting against government um it, the, the whole topic of insurrection generally of, of rebellion of revolution of protest has lots of ambiguity in it. Um, and we could, you know, I see words matter, history matters, coffee matters. Thank you, Dave. Um, that that the fuzziness is part of the impact of it, I guess, is because you can justify it in some ways and others can say it's illicit and the fuzziness allows different definitions to be there. But I guess that's a that's a long historian way of saying the word choice really matters. Is insurrection, would you say insurrection is always a negative connotation or connotates sort of an illicit nature of the rebellion like because i was just noticing that the things library of congress called the insurrections that i wouldn't necessarily have called insurrections like they had things from the french revolution and they had harper's ferry and um yeah so that, that what is the connotation always negative or that it's i don't think i don't think it has to be Negative, I think part of the complication of that has to do with this country in particular, founded from revolution, you know, and that and that, in a sense, the existence of this country suggests a, a, a sort of grounding and legitimacy of revolution to an extreme degree. As a matter of fact, that was some of what people were screaming about this morning on Twitter was, um, you know, the, the, the we're all about you know, the, the ability to violently protest, that's what our country was founded on. And they've been quoting the Declaration of Independence at me. Um, my response is, yeah, and then the Constitution created a government that was supposed to correct some of those problems and have systems within it to allow people to have more power, but that was not a popular argument this morning <laughs> at all. So I, I don't think it's always illicit, um, but I do think they get carried away with themselves sometimes. And so what might start out as something that's valid doesn't end up being valid. You know, was the American Revolution justified? You know, I would say yes, as someone who studied the revolution, many people would say the same thing about the French Revolution. Um, but even at the time, you know, there were people who thought it was uh, the equivalent of an insurrection, that these mm -hmm. were traitors to the government, that they deserved to be hanged as traitors. Um, so even in the moment, uh, in the revolutionary moment, people were contesting these words and that that argument was about the validity of it, the positiveness of it and the acceptability of it. And yeah. in one way or another, insurrection is about power. And there are always going to be people who don't want to lose it. And there are always going to be people demanding more of it. And the question is, what are the inner dynamics of that? And you mentioned that we're sort of grounded in insurrection in this country, so that's it's part of our history. And so Miranda has a question I think is relevant to that. She says, do you feel the long line of rebellion in the state of Virginia from Bacon to the Revolutionary War made Virginians feel rebellion in the Civil War was a just and legal action? Um, these are soldiers who would have grown up around Revolutionary War sites. Their grandparents would have lived through the revolution. Does that, does that history feed into that? Well, I do think claiming the heritage of revolution can feed into that. I think it still does, right, mm -hmm. today. Um, I also think, I mean, on top of that, um, two other things figured into the South and the Civil War. Um, one is that Southerners um, were much more comfortable with, with on the one hand, man-to-man -man violence. Uh, their society was grounded 
on violent repression of an entire population of people. So violence was more immediate and deployed on an everyday basis. And they assumed that Northerners were a bunch of wimps who couldn't <laughs> stand up to anything, right? So in a way, it wouldn't be a war. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be anything. It would just be Southerners saying, you know, get out of here. It doesn't matter. So I, I think there's a tradition of violence in the South. I also think they didn't anticipate the kind of fight that they got. Great. So many good questions here. Um, Rich, chat, folks, if you have a question in chat, put it in Q&A so we yes, can- Yes, please. I, I, I've already got plenty, a lot, a lot in Q&A, which is fantastic. Helps me out a lot. Uh, <laughs> but I don't want to miss any that are in the chat while I'm looking over here. Um, Rich has a question. How much of the rebellions like bacon, shays, and whiskey were driven by Western frontier areas of the colony and state not having properly apportioned representation in the legislative bodies at the time? Well, for sure. I mean, I, that, that is part of it. The other part of it is that people who move to the Western part of these states are people who are probably moving there to get land, which immediately then entangles government, entangles Native Americans, entangles a bunch of things that are going to be more complicated and wrapped up in violence than things that are happening further east. So yeah, I do think that that is related to some of what's happening. And I think it's a great observation. There is a reason why it's the West, Western, parts of the states are less regulated, are contested, are argued, you know, states themselves are arguing about sometimes about who controls those lands. There are all kinds of settlers grabbing at land out there. There are people from Europe grabbing at that, that land as well. So, um, you know, one of the things that the United States, the colonies and then the country were about was the ready availability of land in a way that just was not true in the old world. But what that means is when people came here, you know, just like Bacon and his his buddies, you know, land was the thing they wanted, land was the thing they felt entitled to. Um, and if everyone thinks that, uh, obviously, huge amounts of complications can come about, particularly given that that land is already being populated by people who have been living on it and, and owning it, in a sense, for a very long time. And um, Jeannie has a related thought. Um, if we can sort of distill some of these early insurrections to, to the conflict between America as a country of great men versus democracy is created and continues on the frontier. I'm sorry, ask that again? It just, it's just a related thought from Jeannie that can we sort of distill these early rebellions to the idea it's sort of America as a country of great men versus democracy is created and continues on the frontier. Well, I, I don't think that's necessarily think the case because I think, for example, um, the angry young men that Ed Morgan writes about with Bacon's Rebellion, um, some of them were elite guys and some of them were not. It was a range of different classes of people. They felt that there was a small group of people that had power, but in that case, it wasn't about um, small guys protesting big guys. It was about people with demands who just felt that the people in power weren't meeting their demands. So I don't think it's quite as simple as bucking up against the elite. Um, and, and that also ties into mm -hmm. another component here, which is supposedly one of the things the constitution was supposed to do was create a more representative government that would prevent the need in some cases, not all cases, um, for extreme protest that ideally the system allows you to at least start out by expressing what you demand and need and want through representation. And then if that doesn't work, you then consider other avenues. And uh, sort of a, a more detailed question as we talk about these early insurrections, uh, Dale wants to know if, if you know the answer to this. At the time of the Whiskey Rebellion, wasn't George Washington a major producer of whiskey? And do we know if he paid the required taxes? Oh, I actually don't. No, I don't know this. <laughs> no, I don't know that either. Um, he did produce whiskey. I think they actually remade it and are selling it again or something. And I have never tried it. So I yeah, I think so too. I can't judge it. Um, I have no idea if this is true or not. Um, and I would generally assume since he was so much so big on um, government and, and the power of the new government that he would pay it. Then again, he's a Southern slaveholder, so I don't know what that means too. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I, I know that the people who stood out for adamantly refusing to pay were these people in Western Pennsylvania who, you know, were a unit and, and there are lots of them and they were marching around and that was their point of identity. Yeah. 
but it's interesting. It's certainly a big of economic importance. So that's an interesting, interesting point, Dale. You have to do some more research for us on that. Yeah, that's true. But as we know, there's uh, lots of question as to whether or not we're going to get a bipartisan commission to get the facts on January 6th. So Dave has a question about whether there is anything like this in history. Are there, do we have other other commissions or government investigations? Well, there certainly have been lots of government investigations um, and uh, commissions. Uh, you know, one of the interesting things um, that I discovered when researching my last book, um, one congressman kills another congressman in a duel in 1838, which is a problem. And there's a discussion about what to do about it. And someone says, well, we need an investigation into what happened, why it happened, who did it, what happened. And someone in the, I think this is the House, says, oh, why the heck should we have an investigation? Nothing happens when we have these investigations. We have a committee, they investigate, they emerge and say, we think this, and nothing happens. It's a waste of money, it's a waste of time. And someone responds to that by saying, right, but if we have an investigation into something extreme like that that happens, it shows the American people we have taken it in hand as the government, We've noticed it, we're responding to it, and we wanna mm -hmm. understand what happened. Regardless of the outcome of the committee report, the investigation itself, the fact that the government decides to do that is a sign that the government is alert and watching. And I, I think that that's an interesting and powerful argument. There have been other commissions, and indeed, as the anonymous person on the floor of the House suggested, very often, not a lot happens. That said, even if, you know, nothing happens that, that, that this committee meets, there's a commission, it investigates things, there's a report. If for no reason other than there's a body that gets the facts out so that the public understands what happened, so that the public can see who facilitated things happening, so that we understand what happened, that lawmakers understand what happened, and that that knowledge can inform us going ahead, that's hugely important that, that regardless of what happens now, and there are plenty of things many of us think should happen now, but even if nothing were to happen as a basis of that report, the simple fact of it, the fact that we're, we agree it was illicit, we agree it should be investigated, we agree that it was dangerous, we agree that it shouldn't happen again, and we agree that we need to really understand the dynamics of it, those feel to me like pretty fundamental things that we should be able to agree on. And for the historical record and for um, American governance going forward, not governess, <laughs> governance, um, going forward, I think it's crucially important. It, you know, even better if it does something and there's actually an outcome that sort of helps <laughs> improve things for future, that's even better. But even without that, it's, it's beyond important to me. And if we can't agree that what happened was that wrong, and that dangerous and needs to really be understood if people really don't believe those things that's a big problem that's a big problem thank you and that actually answers several questions many people had that question as well um, your thoughts on importance and also just grounding it historically I, yeah i i one last thing i will say yeah and i i know i tweet about this all the time because i think it's hugely important um the other word I'll throw in here, I know you guys always joke that I always say um, contingency, which I do. And I even said it last night during my, my live event last night. I think someone said, she said contingency twice. The other word that I say a lot, certainly on Twitter, is accountability. Mm. The government is accountable right, to us. Things that people in power do, they are accountable for it. So if they were involved in this in any way, we deserve to know that too. That's another aspect of a functional democracy. Thank you. Um, Rich wants to know, doesn't the Lockean roots of our founding document, the Declaration of Independence, imply that the government has to violate the Constitution slash social contract in order for the rebellion to have legitimacy? Repeat that again for me. <laughs> no, it's a, <laughs> a lot for the brain. Doesn't the Lockean, the Lockean roots of our founding document, the Declaration of Independence, doesn't that imply the government has to violate the constitution and or slash social contract in order for the rebellion to have legitimacy? Well, that's certainly if you're if you're thinking about the Declaration of Independence and not necessarily the Constitution. And so our founding document in and of itself 
we could talk about different meanings of that. So yeah, the, the, the document that in which we declared our independence um, does suggest that if a government um, proves its illegitimacy, then it justifies revolution. All of the folks on Twitter today saying like, see, revolution is justified. Yeah, but then we created a constitution that was supposed to be a form of government that is more grounded on us, we the people. Um, so that you can't directly transfer that argument that anytime you don't like government, you have a right to have a revolution against it. That's like, you know, Tom, and, and Thomas Jefferson, um, James Monroe once said, um, Thomas Jefferson likes to speak large, right? He liked to make these grand pronouncements, you know, a little blood on the tree of liberty now and again is a great thing. Um, that was his way. Those are very quotable words. Um, and if you'd asked him at the time, he probably would have stood behind his meaning. Meaning, if you'd asked Madison or Monroe, they probably would have <laughs> hedged it in a little bit because they didn't they didn't talk as large as as Thomas Jefferson. Um, so more about just how we define insurrections, and I, Tom, I, sus I suspect maybe you're just trying to fill your bingo card here because you know I know you put a lot of insurrections on it, but there is bingo um, cheating. And I have to say, <laughs> those of you who are new here. There are bingo cards that people play during History Matters because apparently I'm so reliable, so predictable, <laughs> that there are things I always say like contingency. So, and, yes. and it's somewhere in chat is the place to go to find bingo cards. And I want yes, to I think it's been mentioned a number of times. Uh, but he, Tom wants to know um, if you would include Muskogee, Anti-Rent Rebellion, Liberty Place, Green Corn, and Draft Riots as insurrections. I thought about that. I particularly thought about draft riots yeah. this morning. Um, and I guess on the one hand, you could say it's revolting against the draft, which is a tool of government. But I don't know if I'd call that an attack on the government. Mm -hmm. So to me, it didn't quite fit in. I, I think this goes back to the earlier point, which is there's a lot of um, it's slippery between these kinds of words. To me, being angry about the draft and protesting against it and being violent to protest against it was not as directly an attack on the government. It was an attack on um, something the government did, whereas closing down courts, as Shays Rebellion did, or um, attacking and intimidating tax collectors so they couldn't do their job, those were attacks on structures of government. So I realize it's a fine line, but to me, that's an important difference. Yeah, no, that's interesting. And it does make me think of more recent things like um, here in Maryland, the Catonsville Nine actually breaking into a, a draft office. Like, is that is that the line when you actually enter? And there was another question in here. Is the line when you enter a government structure or intend to enter a government structure? But then there's there's also sort of state, local, national questions. Yeah, I don't think I could. I don't believe that I can actually successfully or or absolutely draw that line in the sand um i don't think anyone actually really can yeah yeah which is part of the what's interesting and somewhat alarming <laughs> about the topic of insurrection um so much of it depends on on motive and intent uh and process um you know it, it, in that we could have a conversation like this in which we could justify our way in and out um of classifying certain things as certain things. Again, to me, I started with definitions because the explicit attack on the working government to stop it from working mm -hmm. seemed to me like one line that we could draw in the sand, even though it's a it's a big line and there are other yeah. lines we could draw as well. All right, um, from Susan, it's an interesting point. Isn't our election cycle our revolution when addressing our perceived grievances? Well, that's certainly the idea of election is that you have control of the people you put in power. You have the ability to put people in power and take them out of power, put it that way. Elections allow you to give power to people and take it away from people. Not everyone that's involved in government, but key people, your representatives, the president, that's a lot of power. So yeah, the thought was, and has always been, that elections are the ways in which you change governments if you're not satisfied with them. And you see that, you know, um, when Jefferson, after the, the uh, presidential election of 1800, um, in which we came very near to having actual violence, you know, there were people arming in different states, 
to, to take the government if they felt it was being assigned illicitly. And then someone, I know I've mentioned this at some point in the past on, on History Matters, um, someone says to Jefferson, well, what, what then? What would we have done if there had actually been violence? And he says, well, you know, we could have like re-looked at the Constitution and tweaked it a little bit and then just put it back in motion because elections accomplish what they're supposed to accomplish. This one went a little wrong because of a problem which had to do with the president and vice president essentially competing against each other and that's taken away. The Constitution is amended after that. But um, the assumption on all sides was that elections are key for changing governments. The question is outside of elections, um, how much protest were people comfortable with? And people like Hamilton were not comfortable with protest against the government to an extreme degree. So he was not totally comfortable with democracy defined as the politics of the street. And he hmm. would have said, elections, you guys have power of elections. You can put people in power, you can take people out, out of power. That We're not a monarchy, see, elections. But he didn't like the, the people in the streets being in uproar, a state of uproar. Whereas other people in Jefferson and you know the, the Jeffersonian Republicans were far more comfortable with that form of protest and political expression on the part of the populace. And that, that argument wins. I mean, there's a reason why the Federalists sort of fade out of power is a, a broader definition of political democracy in the streets wins. Not super broad, a lot of people still excluded, but broader than the Federalists would have allowed. Well, thank you. I think this has been a exciting discussion that lots of people really were thrilled to take part in. So thank you all for your wonderful questions. That was great. It was um, a really challenging discussion and it felt like a really, that's the word I wanted to use, not quite urgent, but it, there was an immediacy to that discussion, sure. which I, I appreciate, um, even though it was a last minute decision, but it was a last minute decision to talk about something that has a real sense of, of urgency to it. Um, and I, I really appreciate, like, I haven't been able to follow everything that you're saying. Um, and actually, I've been like quietly saving the chat so that I can go back and look at it later. Um, but this was a great discussion. And it's a, I say this every week. It's the perfect example of why what we do here and why things like this matter as much as they do. Bringing people together to talk about really crucial issues of, of our government, of government policy, to have a public discourse, to talk about meanings and implications and impacts, that's hugely important. And it needs to happen more. And we, in doing this, are sort of helping to, to foster that spirit. It, it's enormously important for educators, and it's just enormously important for Americans. So. Um, it's part of why we're doing what we're doing, and you guys are all taking part in that as well. Now, I will mention, as, as Grace said at the outset, um, we now segue to the after party. Um, if you uh, joined us through Facebook, you need to leave Facebook and join us on the NCHE, National Council for History Education website. You need to go to nche.teach.org slash conversations to join us. You just there's just a link to click on and you can join us what we do is we stop recording and the conversation goes on but it's a little more casual and we can talk about whatever we want to talk about so it really is an after party please feel free to join us um and if you are already have joined us through uh the website nchteach.org slash conversations just stay where you are and the after party will begin around you and uh at that i will just say thank you grace for for stepping in uh, with an appropriate background, which I applaud tremendously. Um, and folks who are not going to join the after party, uh, we will see you next week. And as I have said now for the last three weeks, I will try to think of a topic before Thursday night. <laughs> really well, I feel such guilt. I'm like, oh, no, it's eight o'clock. I haven't thought of a topic. So I will try and be better this week. Uh, insurrection is always appropriate, Joanne. So that's <laughs> great. And for everyone, uh, sign if you are signing off, uh, you can find more resources at nchteach.org, like Joanne said, where we've got more information about our St. Louis conference next year. That's all new and up there. So check that out. And Joanne does have a new podcast with Heather Cox Richardson. So that's true. I should say look that. into that too. Um, the podcast is Now and Then, um, which you can find, as I've been told, on Apple and Spotify and wherever you go to find podcasts. Heather Cox Richardson and I are going to have a weekly podcast. It will, uh, it will drop, as the hip people say, um, Tuesday mornings. Uh, and we talk about something going on at the moment and the ways in which history can tell us something about it. Sound familiar? But it's related to the sorts of things we do here. Uh, and it, the first real episode will begin this coming Tuesday. <laughs>
All right. Well, on, on that note, congratulations on that, Joanne. I'm going to turn off Facebook and recording. Excellent.